Johannes will talk about human rights in the age of artificial intelligence. Johannes is a volunteer at Amnesty International. He is a member of the Amnesty International Expert Group on Human Rights in the digi Digital Age. Uh, professionally, he works on the topic of effects of algorithms on digital platforms. If you would like to pose questions for the Q&A session afterwards, um, you can post them on Twitter under hashtag RC3OU, uh, in one word, in small, or in the IRC channel under RC3-OU. Uh, now a warm welcome to Johannes and uh, enjoy the talk. Welcome to our talk, Human Rights in the Age of AI. Dystopia or Shining Future. Tonight, I want to take you on a top-level overview tour through this vast and possibly endless-seeming field. My goal is to give an introduction to the topic that is accessible to beginners, but also to enrich this talk um, by information that makes it valuable and worthwhile for advanced audiences. My name is Johannes Walter and I am speaking to you tonight as a representative of Amnesty International. Let me try to explain in four bullet points or less who Amnesty International is and what we do, just so you know who is talking to you and uh, why. So maybe in one sentence, Amnesty's mission is to campaign for a world where human rights are enjoyed by everyone. We are a non-governmental organization that is independent of any political ideology or economic interest or any type of religious belief. So what is it that we're actually doing in order to achieve our goal of uh, living in a world where everybody enjoys human rights? Very broadly speaking, very broadly speaking, it is two things we do. For one, we are a lobby group. We lobby governments and corporations, companies, such that they stick to their promises and that they respect international law. Amnesty Globally has several million members and we are leveraging that human power in order to document and uncover human rights violations all over the world and then to use um, our ability to create publicity to build up pressure on governments and corporations to make sure that they um, respect human rights. And then the second thing we generally do is we try to keep the public informed about human rights related topics because we believe that the best outcomes for a society are achieved when that society is engaging in a debate, in a discussion on um, how to solve um, any kind of problem really. And we believe that the results that come out of these debates are the better, the better informed the public is. And that is also the reason why I am speaking uh, to you tonight. Now, I feel like it is warranted to start any type of presentation that throws the term AI around by clearly stating and clearly defining what is meant uh, by artificial intelligence. Such a definition is crucial for a couple of reasons, really. Um, for one, the ethical assessment of the moral challenges that come about with AI hinge critically on the definition. You get the definition wrong and the discussion turns into uh, science fiction in the best case. In the worst case, it's a distraction from the actual problem. But then 
there is also this phenomenon, and we talk um, about this topic a lot to people. There is this phenomenon that mentioning the term AI by this point really causes a mental chain reaction uh, that is going on in the heads of people. For some, mentioning AI causes them to be immediately annoyed and turned off because they are worn down and dulled by the constant overuse of the term in meaningless marketing-like settings. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are super excited and thrilled um, as soon as they hear the term AI and they're ready to embark on a discussion about the singularity and superhuman AI. And I think a scientifically sound approach and one that is also closest to um, the results that um, the leading IT companies are achieving these days um, could be the following. Say AI is software that uses statistical algorithms to search and find patterns in large amounts of data and then it's, it's using these learned correlations in the data to make predictions about data points that it hasn't seen yet. And such a software, of course, can also run on hardware, so this would include robotics, obviously, just as well. Now, with this method, companies over the course of the last five or maybe even already eight years have achieved tremendous results. And and those results are the reasons really why we are in a in a up wave in a in a AI um, boom um, these days. So um, computers can nowadays reliably see and speak and listen, react in intelligent ways. And um, in the last two years or so, also we started uh, seeing AIs pop up that can really. Um, start to generate and create their own creative content and um, uh, yeah and, and, and that's why um, it makes sense to talk about this. Now I know that um, some of you might be thinking that the definition I just gave you is closer to um, what is uh, typically meant by machine learning and I'm aware that usually AI is an umbrella term that is um, including but not limited to machine learning. But as you will see throughout the presentation, um, this definition will serve us in the scope of this presentation just fine and um, therefore I will run with it. Now in what ways does artificial intelligence hurt us already today? And in what ways can it possibly develop into an even bigger threat in the future. One um, research article that really kickstarted the whole a, a wider debate about the um, ethical repercussions of AI is the one from two years ago from uh, Burlam Vini and Gebru, in which the, they looked at facial recognition algorithms. So um, two years ago at the time they took three of the most widely used commercial facial recognition algorithms. Um, one was Microsoft and I f forgot the other two, but the big IT companies. And what they did was they were trying to assess the accuracy of the algorithm, but breaking that accuracy down for different demographics. And what they found was quite striking. So. For um, the group of light-skinned males, the algorithm worked almost perfectly. The error rate was 0.8%. Uh, but for dark-skinned women, the error rate was more than 40 times worse. So um, if the algorithm was trying to, um, if, 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 it sees a, if it saw a new picture of, a, um, a people of, of a female people of color, then it um, would, in almost 35% of the cases, misclassify that person as uh, male, for example. Now, 
these algorithms were already used at the time, so we're not talking about something that lies in the future. In fact, um, harm by such algorithms is happening right now. 2020 saw the first case where an American citizen, um, Robert Williams, was wrongfully arrested due to a mismatch by a facial recognition algorithm that um, the police were running. Um, the story would be kind of entertaining if it wasn't that unfortunate and sad because um, as, he, as he states, he was um, working a normal shift when he got a call from the local police department asking him to turn himself in for jail time. So what was happened was the um, police found, um, or the, the police was, invest was investigating a case um, of a, a minor robbery of a local store and the CCTV, uh, the video footage of that store recorded um, a face of a, a black man. Well, the police ran that facial recognition algorithm and the match spit out this um, man, uh, Robert Williams. And he even ended up doing jail time even though later it was um, of course then discovered that he was not responsible um, and uh, he received an apology from the police. It is an interesting case as it is the first account we know of. Um, so like we've seen in these examples algorithms can show discriminatory behavior and that comes maybe as a surprise to some because naively you could think that um, computers are these um, hyper-rational um, machines that are strangers to any kind of emotional bias and therefore discrimination shouldn't be a problem. But as, as we just saw, it is. And so the question is, how can that, how can that happen? And of course, as many of you probably already know, um, one way um, biases can be introduced into AI is by using bad training data. And one particularly striking example is the story of Inyoluva Raji. Um, this young woman, Nigerian born, but uh, now living in the US, um, in, was an intern, uh, did an internship at, an AI, uh, at the AI company um, Clarify. And um, what she uh, was working on there was um, a facial recognition algorithm that was supposed to help clients flag inappropriate images as not safe for work. What she soon um, realized was that images that contain people of color were deemed inappropriate at a much higher rate than imagery that um, contained only white people. And so she started to investigate and what she curiously found out was the problem was in the way the AI was trained. So the, the AI learned inappropriate content from pornography footage and appropriate content from looking at stock photos. As it turns out, porn is much more diverse in terms of skin colors than is stock um, footage which contains mostly white people. So the algorithm learned to associate black skin with inappropriate content. Interestingly when she when she raised this finding um, to when she made it aware uh, when she brought it to the uh, awareness of her managers they were in fact not doing anything about it. The sentiment was it is difficult enough to find good training data or training data at a large scale at all so we're not going to worry too much about representativeness, representativeness for now. Okay, so so much about bad training data but there are other ways on, um, in which um, AIs can be biased um, as well. And one important uh, other reason is if you tell the AI um, the wrong thing to do, if you're not careful about 
how to specify the target objective uh, objective function of the um, algorithm. So I want to share um, a very interesting story, uh, at least in my own opinion, and that is the story of um, how two researchers found a gender bias in ad algorithms on Facebook. So what the authors did was they ran an ad campaign for STEM degrees on Facebook. STEM, of course, being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And um, what would happen is they uh, they just uh, went into the regular um, ad advertisement um, advertising way on Facebook, and people would be shown this ad, and when they click on it, it would take them on a, a website that would inform them about um, the advantages of studying STEM and uh, about um, you know, finding out job opportunities and the like. So um, they ran this for a couple of weeks and when the campaign was done they analyzed the data and what they saw was that the algorithm chose to show this ad much more often to male audiences than to female ones. Now, um, if we are making an ad now, for example, for any type of consumer product, that might not be a problem. But if we're talking about campaigning, um, advertising for something that is uh, having um, further implications for the society, like who studies what and why, then maybe we want to drill into the reason for why the algorithm chose to discriminate between genders here. And the authors uh, first thought that, well, okay, maybe men are just more interested in that uh, in this ad and are more likely to click on it. More likely than women anyways, and therefore it would be somewhat justified to show it more often to men. But when they uh, did the analysis, they, uh, to their surprise, found out that the uh, chances for men and women to click on this ad were basically exactly the same. So now it's getting really interesting, right? Why, uh, if that is the case, then it really seems like the algorithm is discriminating women here. When they drilled further, they found out that the reason lies in the way the uh, target for the AI is defined. So the algorithm was told, or the way the algorithm is coded, is to maximize the ratio between um, impact and cost so that um, it would show the ad um, yeah that it would maximize this ratio and now it turns out that female eyeballs having a contact with an ad impression um, is actually more valuable for advertisers than showing ads to men on average all things equal because, as it turns out, at least in the US, and I um, uh, don't doubt that it is very similar in Europe, as it turns out, women are making the most decisions about what to buy. Big ticket items and uh, all the way down to everyday grocery shopping. And because of that, it is more enticing and interesting for advertisers to reach women. And because it's more valuable, it's also more expensive. Now. Because the probability for men and women was more or less the same to click on the ad, but women were more expensive, it was optimal for the algorithm to show it more often to men. Now, um, when, they, when the authors find out about that result, their immediate first reaction would be, uh, was indeed to go to Facebook and say, hey, Facebook, please, um, we're aware of this problem here. The algorithm seems to discriminate unjustifiedly. Please... Um, make sure that you show this ad in equal proportions to men and women. But quite ironically, exactly that is not possible um, under the current uh, rules on Facebook, exactly in order to prevent discrimination based on gender. So that story really is a nice example also of how we might have to rethink certain rules um, now with the emergence of AI as a widespread technology. Um, I want to share another um, uh, example story of how 
a bad objective uh, objective function can cause problems and that is from a study that was very nicely uh, published in science um, what they did they looked at an algorithm that was used in the American healthcare system and the job of the algorithm was to support um, doctors of medicine um, it would make a suggestion of who should receive further intensive care which patients should receive more care and which are okay with receiving a little bit less intensive care. When they looked at this algorithm, again they found that for patients in the same conditions, black patients were recommended at much lower rates for intensive care than white patients. And what they found out was the algorithm was told to proxy um, medical, uh, the need for medical intensive care by how much money the healthcare system spends on a certain type of patient. Now, because the American healthcare system is, structur is structurally uh, disadvantaging black people, there is less money spent in the healthcare system already over the last decades on black people than on white people. So again, with the same conditions, black people would, decided by humans now, receive less care and less money. The algorithm seeing this data would infer that black people are more healthy and don't need as much care, which is, of course, um, bringing this whole uh, uh, argument uh, ad absurdum. So we've seen um, now how um, AIs can discriminate and for what reasons that is. Now I want to talk uh, a little bit about another important um, way in which AI could be um, detrimental to our societies and that is talking about deepfakes. Now um, without delving into the technicalities too much, um, deepfakes are manipulated video, audio or uh, images um, and they have been manipulated by so-called deep neural networks. And in effect, what that means is we can now create videos that um, can be altered at an unprecedented ease and at almost close to zero cost. And it is easy to imagine how that can be dangerous. Um, for example, I've seen a paper recently uh, that introduced an AI that is capable of removing people or objects out of a video entire, entirely without leaving, leaving almost any artifacts in the, in the image. We've seen the last two US elections, we've seen um, Brexit, we've seen over the last nine months the debate going on, going on about COVID-19 and it is really easy to, to see how in the 2020s decade that is lying ahead of us um, our democratic discourse can be negatively influenced by bringing about fake news um, deep fakes into, into the discussion especially considering that there are internationally actors that have a vested interest in interrupting a, a smooth democratic process in Western countries. But as it uh, turns out, it's not only Western countries that are concerned about deep fakes. So um, China's internet regulator, for example, announced um, a ban of fake news that have been created by deep fakes and they even uh, discussed to ban the uh, deep fake technology altogether. Um, and then on the other side of the earth, in the US, California has already taken action against deep fakes, such that since last year it is now illegal to use deep neural networks to alter images that w or video that would um, bias the way um, a politician's action or words are received by a wider audience. So I've talked now about discrimination and about 
deepfakes a little bit in uh, greater detail because discrimination by AI is really a topic that is that has seen a lot of attention by policymakers and researchers and because deepfakes becoming more and more prevalent but of course there are many other ways in which AI can be problematic for us and I just want to um, list a couple of ways and I want to embed that in a um, by by adding a couple of words um, to the question of um, do we need new human rights do we need digital human rights possibly in order to deal with these problems and I said there is an ongoing debate and um, it is far from being settled but at least um, f speaking for our um, group at Amnesty, I think uh, it is safe to say that there is a tendency forming to say that uh, no, in fact, we do not need new human rights in order to cover all these problems that I've talked about, but the ones that we already have uh, just need to be applied in the appropriate manner. But of course, this discussion is far from being over. And just to uh, sort the, the cases, the examples I've talked about so far and to give a, a, a little bit of a taste for what other problems are being out there and how they relate to human rights. Um, if we look at the um, human rights as defined by the Universal Declar Declaration of Human Rights, uh, we, we can go through a couple. And of course I'm aware that the uh, Universal Declaration is not legally binding as it isn't um, a contract of international law but of course most if not all um, rights have been implemented into um, legally binding very much legally binding national law and so for example the uh, case about uh, Robert Williams that I've mentioned a couple of minutes ago would um, fall into the domain of article 2 which is the right to non-discrimination um, uh, another uh, another field about which uh, we could do an entire presentation is predictive policing, which uh, falls in the domain of this Article 2. And of course there is Article 3, the, uh, right, the right to life and liberty. And here, of course, we have to mention autonomous weapon systems, which is basically um, killer robots that have been um, deployed with some kind of, um, for example, facial recognition, AI, or um, an AI that allows it to make the decision um, of whether to um, go forth with a lethal strike without a human in the loop. Then, of course, there is um, Article 12, the right to privacy, and I've talked um, in great detail about facial recognition by now, but of course here we could also talk about this system of data surveillance that the big IT companies are basically um, putting us all into. Um, Article 20, the freedom of assembly, could be um, endangered, for example, by um, facial recognition AI because some people might choose not to go to a demonstration if they are um, afraid that the police might um, identify them individually and that this is far from a dystopian uh, in a future lying problem we have seen um, at the protests in Hong Kong over the last years. Um, of course, Article 18, freedom of thought, could be endangered by, for example, the pro problem of deep fakes poisoning our democratic um, discussion. And um, even all the way down to um, people being discriminated based on um, protected attributes. We have seen, for example, um, gender and uh, race, but of course there are many other that could be um, in question here. So um, this, this just to, like I said, give you a, a glimpse of um, how far-reaching this is, but the title is called um, Dystopia or Shining Future, so I also want to talk a little bit about um, how AI can be used as a force for good. And um, there is good reason to, to be hopeful and to believe that AI can be helpful as well. 
So, for example, um, AI image recognition um, algorithms have been used to document human rights violations in, um, in Yemen, in Syria, and Amnesty International, for example, has used it to document um, human rights violations in um, Darfur, which is a, a, a western region of Sudan. And um, what was happening there, the, the region of uh, Darfur wants uh, more uh, participation in the national uh, in the national political affairs of the state and so um, the, the conflict escalated and the uh, government was fighting against rebels and Amnesty is accusing the um, national government to um, use chemical weapons against the population and now in order to gather evidence of these crimes what Amnesty did was looking at satellite images um, before and after such a chemical attack uh, because um, these chemical attacks would um, expel the uh, population of certain villages and of course what we could have done is using drawing on a large amount of volunteers who would then classify these images by hand but of course it is much more efficient um, and faster and impactful to use AI in this context and in um, a very similar vein, Amnesty is running the Toxic Twitter project. So that is now uh, switching subjects. We're now um, talking no longer about uh, human rights violations in, in countries, but about the problem of violent, sexualized um, hate speech against women on Twitter. And um, what Amnesty is doing here is again trying to document this problem and to um, build up pressure and force Twitter to take action such that um, everyone feels um, safe and secure in this uh, social space that Twitter is um, that Twitter is nowadays. And um, again, what we're doing is now we use text um, NLP, uh, text uh, analyzing algorithms that help us classify millions of tweets into um, dangerous hate speech or into appropriate content. And um, for example, um, doxing is a large problem. Um, that is, for example, the, the act of publishing private information about someone online such that then others can uh, go and be uh, go and use that information to make uh, death threats in real life or, or so on. Um, these are two very uh, precise examples of um, what we did. Um, but of course Amnesty is not the only one. There is uh, has great work has been done um, to use AI to recognize displaced people or to use AI to analyze the background of um, child uh, pornography um, videos um, such that then similar backgrounds could be uh, an indication that it was filmed by the same group or individual which would be a hint that helps the police to um, uh, find the uh, criminals who made these uh, this video and therefore breaking um, child pornography and sex trafficking rings but then there is also this very fundamental hope that AI as a general purpose technology can have tremendous positive effects on um, a humanity on a global scale even. So what I mean by saying general purpose technology is that AI is really considered to be not just any other new innovation but it is considered to be an innovation that is impactful for in basically all domains of human lives that like in a domino effect causes new innovations and discoveries that improve the living conditions. 
um, just like the uh, just like electricity did uh, 140 years ago. Um, AI, for example, could be used in the context of fighting climate change. We could, um, for example, use it to monitor um, the biodiversity and the um, climate conditions, heat in remote areas in the world. It could be used to improve the climate, the predictive power of the climate models such that we can adjust our behavior accordingly. Um, then not only in the fight against climate change, it could also be used uh, in the domain of uh, health. And one noteworthy example here is um, Google's Alpha Fold, which um, is a discovery that or a, a achievement that some of you might have heard, a very recent one just last month, and uh, one that I think did not actually uh, receive the media attention that it deserved because what uh, this group around this AI achieved is to they solve the protein folding problem, which was one of the fundamental um, problems of the last 50 years in uh, molec molecular uh, biology, um, meaning that the AI can now predict the way in which um, a protein uh, folds up, and that allows us to much faster and much cheaper devise new materials. Materials which then again could be used in the fight against climate change because they are more energy efficient. Or new, or new um, proteins that could allow for better and more efficient medication. And then of course um, in an economic sense AI could be um, hopefully used to um, improve the productivity and to um, boost global living standards. Um, and that is important, of course, because human rights are no, not limited uh, to these uh, political rights that you might be uh, typically thinking of, uh, as we've seen, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and so on. But of course, human rights encompass nowadays also socio-economic rights. And um, if uh, we, we make the best out of that technology, we can be hopeful that um, all these achievements come into fruition in the future. But in order to achieve that, we have to make sure that artificial intelligence does actually behave in a safe manner. And so how would we go about to do that? Um, Policymakers and researchers have really started to think in detail about this problem. So um, you see uh, the expert boards popping up in the last couple of years that are dealing with this problem of safe AI um, all over the place. There is the AI high level expert group of the European Commission, there is the German Data Ethics Commission, and basically any kind of company that uh, thinks of itself as IT company has set up an AI ethics um, or has at least published an, an ethics paper about AI. Um, for example, to the left you see um, a graph from the report of the German Data Ethics Commission and what they say is, well, we can divide AI according to their potential harm. They call it according to their potential criticality. And the base of this triangle in green is the uh, vast amount of AI algorithms that is um, unproblematic. And they say these algorithms would not cross the threshold uh, in, in order to, uh, for the, uh, to have the need to be regulated. And then on the other end of the triangle you have this red tip which would be very few AIs but these really should not be allowed to be used at all. So, for example, um, in, the, in the green field, you could think of an uh, algorithm that identifies whether the coin that is thrown into a vending machine is actually the appropriate amount of money. And, the, uh, exa and an example for an AI that should be uh, forbidden entirely could be uh, one out of the field of autonomous weapon systems. But of course, the interesting, um, the interesting debate is going on in this yellow to orange field in the middle. Um, 
Then there is also um, a report that Amnesty has published with Access Now called the Toronto Declaration. And in it, Amnesty is demanding that public and private actors who employ AI systems are being held accountable, that they ensure a safe development of AI um, and a couple of concrete suggestions. For example, to make sure that the developer team of an AI is um, diverse in many senses. So thinking back uh, to the example of um, the story of Inyoluva Raji, um, you, you remember that her managers um, did not actually care even after she brought the problem to their attention. And having a diverse team that is possibly even affected by the detrimental effects of AI could help out here. What all of these uh, suggestions to ensure safe AI have in common is that they're calling for an element of human oversight and for a way in which we can um, make sure that humans can understand how the AI is coming to its decisions. And while that is desirable, it is also um, extremely difficult for two reasons. So, um, in contrast to traditional code, you can't just look at the source code and do a code audit in order to find out the flaws in the program. AIs are so-called black boxes. You see the input that goes in and you observe the output. But in these billions of parameter large neural networks, it is impossible even for the developers to determine how the AI arrives at a certain result. And the second problem is that unlike, for example, um, um, auditing uh, uh, to make sure that a car runs safely, AIs are changing in such a frequent or possibly even continuous manner that the auditing process should also be somewhat uh, made continuously. Now, like I said, there is a lot of research going on about this and there are um, and ideas exist about how to tackle these problems. So what all of these possible solutions have in common is a kind of what I, what I would call a crowd or expert based AI challenging system. So what that means is you circumvent this black, black box problem by um, feeding the AI with input and uh, trying to feed it with input that brings the AI to, to make, to commit a mistake. And then you can infer, um, so to say, where the problem area of an AI really lies. And um, um, it is also, of course, important to ensure that the um, consideration for safe AI is um, in the mind of the developers from point one of the development so that we can do these challenging processes not just after the AI has been deployed and affected possibly millions or billions of people, but already that there is an internal auditing process uh, that defines clearly uh, steps and document, documents these steps of what decision is made in order to develop this AI and how, such that in the end there is a, an accountability report that can um, possibly already take the biggest kinds of problems out of the AI before it is even um, reaching a larger audience. So it's, with the examples I gave you from earlier, it is easy to see um, how it would have been possible to spot a problem in the um, uh, in the facial recognition algorithms, for example, by just making sure that the training data is actually representative of the general U.S. population. That brings me to my conclusion. So, are we headed for a dystopia or are we headed for a shining future? Now, I could um, make my life easy and say um, we're going for a middle ground, but I want to be there here and I think there is good reason to be optimistic. Of course, I've talked a lot about problems that we already have today and about potential problems in the future. And of course, with 
every type of new technology, regulation and supervision is always trailing a little bit behind. But as you have also seen, researchers and um, policymakers have been become aware of the potential problems and with the potential of this technology, if we make sure that we continue on a good trajectory into the future, I think we are actually headed more for the shining future than for the dystopia. Let me um, end the talk by just pointing out a few um, things about the literature. So uh, these are my sources and all of these except for the last one here uh, should be accessible for free. Um, also, um, Timnit uh, Gebru, who is the author of the uh, third paper, um, has uh, uh, some interesting developments going on about her. If you want to follow her on Twitter, that is interesting. Also, um, the last bullet point here, um, Inyoluva Raji is a shooting star of the ethical AI scene. It's also worth following her on Twitter. Um, and the rest of the sources um, also um, except for the first one, all available for free online. I want to thank the awesome and, tel uh, and talented photographers um, who were kind enough to allow me to use their stock um, images for free. And I want to end by saying that if you are interested in any of the things that I have mentioned today, um, especially if you're interested in some of the topics I have merely touched upon, like uh, predictive policing or data surveillance, then please don't hesitate to get in touch uh, with our expert group, visit our homepage, or if you have questions directly about this talk, then um, get in touch with me directly. But of course, I'm also looking forward to see you now in the uh, Q&A session and um, take your questions there. Thank you very much. Um, uh, political decision makers um, on a broader level have an awareness about the problem, or do you think this is really uh, just tied to some experts for the moment? I think we begin to see um, that uh, the awareness for the problem uh, trickles down to the um, for a general uh, political into a general political sphere. So I I would imagine that during the next ten years, we uh, as a society in general will start discussing this problem on a much wider scale. So I'm optimistic about that. Okay, and um, so uh, going on the more positive side, um, if uh, there was to be a, um, a shining future, um, what possible obstacles are there to overcome still? Um, I think uh, one problem, and there are a lot of talks uh, during this um, RC3 that are concerned with that, is getting the big IT companies in check. We will have to find uh, one way or another to, uh, we have to find a way to uh, deal with the big tech monopolies, because they are the ones who are employing the most uh, cutting edge um, AI technology, and if we succeed in that, um, then I think we can be uh, also optimistic about um, leveraging the technology to the full potential and to so that it actually does good. Mm. And, and I mean, that has a lot to do with your first question. So I mean, of yeah. course, none of this is um, out of our control. If there is enough political will, then um, it's feasible. Mm. Okay, so what would your opinion be actually on seals, um, in German the term is Gütesiegel, uh, on uh, approval um, that are in discussion at the moment for AI to ensure safe technology. Can you say anything about seals? So, uh, like I uh, tried to, to point out in my talk, there is a lot of talks going on about the fact that we have to um, audit in one way or another AI, but nobody is really going into the specifics of how to do that. And um, attaching a seal uh, onto an AI, like the way you would attach a, a seal on a car when you send it to the TÜV here in Germany after it got checked, um, is probably a poor analogy. 
Um, mm -hmm. Like I said in the talk, you have the problem that AIs are co changing constantly and um, you can't just like open the, the hood of the car and look at the motor as they are these black boxes. So we will have to find new ways to do um, to do these audits and I think a zeal that only ever um, confirmed at a certain point in time that the AI isn't misbehaving is a fundamentally flawed concept. But uh, there's a lot of research going on in this field right now and I'm, um, I guess we will see new approaches in the next years. We have to, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there is no other way. Yeah. Is there actually anything that we can do as individuals to take action as like non-researchers and non-experts? Um, I think, well, th that's a difficult question. I mean, um, probably on a, on a general uh, note, it is important that the public is aware of the problem and that people are informed enough about uh, the, the details so that they can come to a um, useful judgment about their everyday uh, life use of technology that employs AI. So, I mean, um, for example, when we uh, use YouTube or other um, social media that are using recommender systems and we grow aware that, um, that there are problems like um, echo chambers that are um, arising, then we need to channel our frustration with that into a constructive um, Form, for example, like talk to your representative in the uh, in your national parliament, um, and or, or call them, write them about the, this problem, so that we can then use the political power to uh, ensure safe regulation. Otherwise, I don't know. It's difficult to um, on a on an individual level, of course, but uh, yeah, together um, leveraging that force sure. could do something. So, but raising awareness is uh, always a very good first step. Can I actually ask, how did you personally get interested in this topic, or how did you first become aware of it? Um, so, I um, have been working on um, digital, um, on the problem of how algorithms affect uh, the society for um, one and a half years now in my job, and I've been a member of uh, the Amnesty um, expert group on uh, human rights in the digital age for about uh, two years now. And in fact, I mean, that's, it's also a new field for us at Amnesty. So we are, um, basically this presentation is also a, a report about the work in progress that we're doing, wrestling with, um, coming up with concepts on, on, on how to work on the problem of AI and human rights. Um, yeah, so, so I grew into that over the last two years or so. Okay, um, so since uh, 2024, 20, uh, many reasons has been a challenging year, um, but uh, um, regarding the topic that you're working on, what are your wishes for 2021? Um, well, it would be cool if, um, right, from, from a research perspective, it would be cool if um, some large IT companies um, open up uh, their source code for, for example, AI models they no longer use to um, allow the research community to, uh, to have a, a deep dive look at that. Um, and in the research community also, the, the, for the, like in a similar vein, that researchers start sharing the code they produce with their papers um, for everyone, which is shockingly um, not the case in many, in many, uh, for many papers. So uh, yeah, there needs to be a, a shift in mindset and um, we see that beginning already and it, that would be a cool trend to continue for 2021. Great. Well, I hope the right people were listening just now. Um, well, Indeed. thank you, Johannes, very much for this interesting talk. If uh, you and um, uh, everyone uh, at home at, the, at your screens would like to continue the discussion, then uh, please join Johannes in the Jitsi room. You can find that uh, under discussion.rc3.ou.social. I repeat, discussion.rc3.ou.social. Thank you very much and see you there. Thank you.